I am very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Steve Williams. He is our chairman of the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine at Boston University and the chief of rehab services here at Boston Medical Center. He's also an associate professor of rehabilitation medicine at Boston University School of Medicine, as well as the director of the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation Neuro Recovery Network here at BMC. He serves as our principal investigator for several spinal cord injury related research projects, including the New England Regional Spinal Cord Injury Center Model Systems Pro Project. He received his Bachelor's of Arts degree in history from the University of Virginia and his medical degree in 1994 from Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk. He's board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation, and he has a subspecialty certified in spinal cord medicine. And he completed his residency training in physical medicine and rehabilitation at Rusk Institute in New York. His current research interests include the development of emerging rehab technologies to improve the lives of people with severe disability and neuro neurogenic bone metabolism and spinal cord injury. He has published over 26 original peer-reviewed articles and abstracts covering these topics presented at over 40 invited lectures on aspects of people living with spinal cord injury. Dr. Williams. Thank you very much, Claudine. And so now that you all know I graduated from medical school in 1994, you can calculate my age, but keep it a secret. <laughs> so tonight I am very honored to be here and to talk to you about spinal cord injury from the moment of injury to leading a full and healthy life. When you see the slides, don't get scared. They, there is a lot of information on some of the slides and some of it is very technical. And what I'm going to do is to explain to you what is on each slide, hopefully in, in a very basic language that is understandable. So if you don't understand what I'm talking about, raise your hand and I'll go back and I'll talk again. The slides are technical, especially for the first part of the talk, because we're going to talk about the inflammatory process after spinal cord injury. And so I'm going to try to explain to you about the different types of cells uh, that are migrating into the area and causing the spinal cord injury. We're going to talk about past treatments and what the problems were with some of the past treatments. And we're going to talk about some of the current research in helping to decrease inflammation. And then the second part of the talk, I think, will be very valuable to everyone who is here. And it's really about preventative medicine and primary care medicine for people with disabilities. And so we're going to go through that as well. You'll notice as we go through that I'm often going to reference uh, the articles. This is an evidence-based medicine lecture. I actually gave a very similar talk at Mount Sinai Medical School in New York last year. And so I reviewed about 200 articles for that talk and uh, there are about 50 references here. So you're going to see all the references. If you're interested, we can email you uh, the lecture, which uh, you could go back and find the articles if some of them interest you. So as I said, the talk is titled Spinal Cord Injury from the Moment of the Injury to Leading a Full and Healthy Life. But when I gave the talk at, NY, um, at Mount Sinai Medical School, it was called um, spinal cord injury treatment, what does the future hold? And however, at the same time I had thought, I could just as easily have entitled the talk spinal cord injury medicine, what we don't know. And I would suggest to you that what we don't know is enormous in scope. Spinal cord injury medicine is very young field, and so there's a lot of research still to be done. And so as we go through this, particularly in the preventive care and the primary care section, you're going to see that as I talk about the various tests that everyone is scheduled to have, that there are challenges for people with disabilities to have them, and that research for these tests for people with disabilities has been very limited, and I'll talk to you about it as we go on. So the first will be a review of the cellular mechanisms involved in the cellular response. And uh, particularly, what I want to do is talk to you about the cells that contribute to the acute injury. In this section, we'll review both the shortcomings of the current standards of care and anti-inflammatory response and the new ones, as I said. In order to understand new treatments geared toward dampening the inflammatory response following acute spinal cord injury, we need to review the cellular inflammatory response immediately following the injury. 
And all this inf although this information is very technical and very basic science-y, I think it is important to understand at a cellular level exactly what is happening in the spinal cord injury, when the different cell types are appearing following the injury, and what each uh, cell type's impact is on the injured tissue, because this will help us understand as we go further into the talk some of the future treatments. And I'm going to raise this a little bit. So uh, this information has been studied in rat models uh, for a long time, but has only recently been elucidated in humans. And Jennifer Fleming and her colleagues at the uh, University of Western Ontario, as well as her colleagues at the Miami Project in Miami, recently published this brilliant article uh, in the journal Brain in 2006, which clears up what is happening in the human inflammatory response. And in the early spinal cord injury, we have migration of a type of cell called neutrophils. And neutrophils are a type of white blood cell. And we also have uh, migration of a type of cell called microglial cells. And these cells are monocytes. And uh, these cells first appear in the injured tissue within the first one to three days following the injury. And these cells secrete various inflammatory agents that are involved in destroying the neural tissue. Fleming identified the types of cells and the way she identified them was and their migration into the spinal cord injury was by looking at what they were secreting. And these cells secrete two things. One is called myeloperoxidase and the other we call GP91. As you can see it has an enormous uh, biochemical name, but the simple name is GP91. And the way she did this was she took sections of spinal cord uh, in patients who had died immediately following their spinal cord injury, so people who did not live to the ER, and she sectioned the spinal cord and looked at it under a microscope and she stained it and she was identify, able to identify using these two uh, types of stains and these uh, chemical agents, what kinds of cells were coming in. And these two enzymes contribute to the cell damage immediately occurring after the injury. She also identified a type of cell called the CD68 immunoreactive cells. And they are associated with a type of cell called a phagocytic macrophage. And phagocytic macrophages, I remember when I was in medical school, they're like the trash can. Essentially, phagocytic macrophages are going around and they are chewing up all the other debris that is being created. So there's this enormous inflammatory process. There's this migration of neutrophils and activated monocytes into the area, and they're secreting these uh, various uh, inflammatory mediators that are causing cell death. And as those cells are dying, then there are these phagocytic macrophages that are cleaning that up and they're just chewing it up. And that is occurring also almost immediately after the spinal cord injury. As well, there is an inflammatory uh, factor that's released called tumor necrosis factor. And it's produced by the microglial cells, the monocytes, and it causes the pro-inflammatory process that leads to the destruction of a cell type called oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes are the supporting network for the nerves. So you have the nerves there, and they're being supported by oligodendrocytes, and you have destruction of that cellular network. So the cables that are supporting the cells are being destroyed. Then you have the nerve cells themselves being destroyed. And so there's lots of destruction going on. And Harrington uh, actually published a paper in the Journal of Neurotrauma in 2005 that demonstrated that tumor necrosis factor was there within six hours. So we're already seeing destruction of the backbone of the neural system as well as destruction of the neurons. And as you may recall, those of you who were at our annual conference in October, one of the things that Dr. Uh, Kirstead talked about was he identified a chemical called NOGO. And NOGO is uh, a chemical that prevents, that could prevent these oligodendrocytes from being destroyed. And it had never been elucidated until he found this chemical and he found a way to block it so that this tumor necrosis factor cannot get there, and so it can't destroy the backbone of your neural network. I promise you it's not going to be this technical all the way through.
okay? So when we look at tumor necrosis factor, there are two types of receptors. And one of these receptors is found on the oligodendrocyte. And so the oligodendrocyte has this receptor, the tumor necrosis factor goes right there, it fits right into it, and then it causes the cell death. And Dr. Liu actually discovered that, and he published that in a, in a wonderful journal called Cell in 1996. So we've known what has been occurring for a very long time. Glutamate is another factor. Glutamate, we all have probably heard of glutamate. Glutamate is an amino acid. It's found in our food, etc. But it's the major neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. So it's what allows our nervous system to actually talk to cell to cell. And glutamate plays an important role in fast transmission of these nerve signals. So it allows us to uh, think very rapidly, to have very rapid interaction between our neurons. However, in excess, glutamate becomes what we call excitotoxic. So it, it becomes so active that it becomes toxic to the cells and uh, may be overactive in key areas of the brain and spinal cord causing nerve damage as well. And glutamate is released as well immediately following the spinal cord injury in very, very large volumes. So the pro-inflammatory mediators that we have discussed are myeloperoxidase, GP91, tumor necrosis factor, and glutamate. These are the four uh, pro-inflammatory mediators, the things that are causing all the inflammation. And so what we're going to talk about is how do you stop these mediators from being secreted. And if you could stop these mediators from being secreted, you could then inhibit cell death. And if you inhibit cell death, you preserve neurons. And if you preserve neurons, you preserve function. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to prevent these from being secreted. So one of the first anti-inflammatory neuroprotective agents, which many of you may have received, is something called the methylprednisolone protocol. It's a steroid protocol that was developed in the 1990s by Dr. Bracken and his colleagues, and we're also going to talk about GM1 ganglioside treatment. Um, when we talk about the methylprednisolone protocol, I'm going to describe to you what happens with the methylprednisolone protocol. So it's a very potent steroid. And in patients who did not have penetrating injuries, so in patients who did not have a gunshot wound or a stabbing wound, the standard of care was the treatment with methylprednisolone after this big study was done in the late 1990s. So what happened was, over a series of three studies, it was found that if you gave steroid in a whopping dose, uh, essentially you get 5.4 milligrams per kilogram of body weight uh, in a drip, but you get a loading dose of 23 milligrams per kilogram of this. So it's an enormous dose of steroid that is given. And if you arrived within the ER within three hours of your injury, you get the drip for 24 hours. And if you arrive between three and eight hours of your injury, you get it for 48 hours. And then they found that if you arrived after eight hours after your injury, there was no benefit. Now, we have all heard about steroids. Many of us have taken steroids. But this is a massive dose of steroids. And the goal is we know that steroids are potent anti-inflammatory agents. So the goal of this huge dose of steroid was to dampen this inflammatory response and to prevent all this cell death from occurring. And when the studies were done, it, it was shown that people who received methylprednisolone protocol actually had preservation of function. But as with all, all treatments, there are both good effects of them and there are bad effects of them. So as well as being a very potent anti-inflammatory agent, steroids are also very potent immune suppressants. So there were also studies that then went back and looked at patients who had received this big dose of steroids, and what did it do to their bodies? And so in 1997, there was an article published by Gernt from the University of Michigan that showed that patients who had received this huge dose of steroid had a two and a half time increased incidence of pneumonia in the ICU, as well as a two and a half percent 
increase in number of ventilated days. So many of them developed pneumonia, many of them ended up on ventilators because their immune system was suppressed. And so they would be on ventilators longer, two and a half times longer than patients who didn't. So we preserved some neuronal function, but there was an effect of that. As well, it was shown in a later study by Wing at Vancouver Hospital that patients who received methylprednisolone, potent steroids, also developed something called avascular necrosis of the hip, which means that their hip, the blood supply to their hip bone, would often uh, be interfered with, and the, the top of the joint, the head of the hip bone, would necrose or die. And so they would often have hip problems. It was also shown that patients who received the methylprednisolone protocol had many more urinary tract infections in the first year after their injury as compared to those who didn't. So one of the things that you're going to see as we go through, there are definite advantages to many of these neuroprotective agents, but they all have side effects. And so we're constantly weighing the risk-benefit ratio for all of these. So does this agent benefit a patient? And is the benefit good enough to take the risk associated with the side effects? Because of all these side effects, in 2002, the neurosurgeons, who are the people who always give the methylprednisolone protocol, came out and they said, it had been the standard of care in the United States, and it really still is the standard of care if you arrive in the ER within eight hours. But they said because there are these risks associated with it that every patient should be evaluated in the ER for the risk-benefit ratio. Obviously, if you're in the ER and you've had a spinal cord injury, we rapidly try to preserve neuronal tissue, so it remains the standard of care, but there are complications associated with it. The other anti-inflammatory agent, which was trialed but never FDA approved, was something called a GM1 ganglioside treatment. And, and it was trademarked as a drug called Cygen. And so GM1 gangliosides are actually proteins that are naturally present in cell membranes of nerves in the spinal cord and brain. And they help prote protect against cell ner nerve death by protecting against the various neurological insults, including excitotoxicity. So they help prevent uh, cell death from glutamate. So this study looked at uh, 34 patients who were treated within three days of their injury with daily intravenous injections of Cygen for 100 days. And at one year follow-up, neurological recovery was assessed, and it appeared that patients who had received Cygen had better strength scores than those who had not received Cygen. However, on further analysis, it looked that like individual muscle recoveries revealed that the increased recovery from this drug was actually not that paralyzed muscles were gaining strength, but that weak muscles were getting stronger. So the drug People did seem to have some improvement, but it wasn't that we were getting par that we were saving tissue. It was just simply probably natural progression. So weak muscles got stronger as people participated in physical therapy. So this drug was never really shown to have a benefit. It looked like it initially did, but ultimately when you went back and looked at the data, it didn't have a benefit. So it was not approved by the FDA. So those were the two major anti-inflammatory uh, agents that we had and that we have used in the past. And so now researchers are still trying to look at ways to inhibit this inflammatory process. We're also going to talk a little bit about surgical decompression after we talk about these inflammatory agents. So future anti-inflammatory agents, these neuroprotective strategies are going to be directed at these neutrophils that we started off talking about. So these activated monocytes and these activated microglial cells that are secreting GP91 and that are sec secreting myeloperoxidase. And the goal is to decrease this inflammatory process and save neural tissue. So the first one we're going to talk about, and you all have probably seen the commercials for this one, the drug is called Enbrel. Its generic name is Etanercept, and it's actually used for rheumatoid arthritis. 
And you have probably seen commercials for Enbrel, you know, where everybody's doing their Tai Chi, et cetera. That's the Enbrel commercial. So rheumatoid arthritis and rheumatoid processes are essentially inflammatory processes. And so these drugs actually work on that tumor necrosis factor that's released. Remember I told you that tumor necrosis factor is released and it attaches to the oligodendrocyte and when it attaches to the oligodendrocyte that's the backbone that supports the neural tissue and the tumor necrosis factor causes a breakdown of that backbone. So these drugs are being used to prevent the tumor necrosis factor from actually uh, attaching to the oligodendrocyte and thereby preventing something, a, a technical word which I left in here, apoptosis, which means cell death. And uh, Genovese actually showed that Enbrel in rats who had spinal cord injury was able to reduce death of oligodendrocytes. So then, after Genovese did that study, he went and looked at combining Enbrel with steroids. And essentially, he combined Enbrel with dexamethasone. And dexamethasone is once again a type of steroid. And so he found that patients who had a combination of these two drugs Enbrel and dexamethasone actually, in these rats, actually had preservation, even more preservation of neural tissue. But essentially, when we think about those two coming together, they're both very potent, very powerful drugs. And so we have to once again think, we don't know what the side effects are. We know what the side effects are in rats, but these studies haven't occurred in humans yet. So will these drugs have an even greater effect on the immune system? Will patients who receive these drugs potentially have even greater immune suppression? Will there be more pneumonias? Will there be more urinary tract infections? So as you can see, this is such a complicated process all coming together, all these cells there, so many ways to be directed at trying to preserve tissue, at the same time trying not to harm. So it's very complicated. There's another drug that's being studied called Rilazole. Rilazole is an anti-glutamate agent. Remember we talked about glutamate, an amino acid that is a normal neural transmitter, but in spinal cord injury, big volumes of it are dumped into the system and it causes excitotoxicity of the cells. The cells become very excited and they die. So Rilazole is actually a drug that has been used in ALS patients and it has been shown to slow disease progression. So ALS is actually spinal cord dysfunction. It's not a traumatic spinal cord injury, it's, but it's similar. ALS, MS, spinal cord injury can all be grouped together because they're spinal cord dysfunction. So Rilazole has been shown to slow disease progression in ALS and the question has been hypothesized, what would happen if you gave Rilazole during the acute phase of treatment in spinal cord injury? Would we be able to lower the glutamate and preserve some tissue? So the Rilazole trial is just beginning and this is the first drug trial of the North American Clinical Trials Network which is sponsored by the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation and I'm their data safety monitor and we're having a meeting tomorrow in Palm Beach. So I'm very excited because I think it's supposed to rain the whole weekend, but I'm going to be in Palm Beach. Unfortunately, I'll probably be in a room the whole time that I'm there, but I am going to try to get out some. So Realizol may be a drug um, that may be very helpful. And so there are 10 centers across the United States and Canada that is going to begin this uh, protocol within the next six months. <coughs> So some other thoughts on early spinal cord injury treatment. So we're looking at preventing the inflammatory process. As I said, surgical decompression is very important. So early surgical decompression. If you have a spinal cord injury and you have a fracture and there's bone that is laying on the cord, we want to get that bone off as rapidly as possible because the pressure of the bone on the cord uh, causes cell death. So cells die from pressure, they die from bleeding into the cord. When a spinal cord injury occurs, essentially you have disruption of the canal. With disruption of the canal, you have the cord being pinched or uh, pressure put on it. 
you have bleeding into the cord. When the bleeding occurs into the cord, the nerve tissue is very sensitive to it. And so with that bleeding comes in the neutrophils, the microglial cells. They're all rushing in and they're all attacking the cells. And then the glutamate is increasing and the glutamate is causing cell death. And the tumor necrosis factor is being released and it's going to the oligodendrocytes and causing the damage in the backbone. So, you know, as well as giving these anti-inflammatory agents, we want to get people to the OR rapidly, if possible, to relieve pressure because as well as cells dying from blood, cells are dying from compression. They're being pinched to death. So early surgical decompression is important. Stem cells will probably be an important component of early spinal cord injury treatment in the future. And as you know, Dr. Kirstead and what is the name of the drug company? I started to say Genzyme, but it's not Genzyme. What is the drug company? Gen Geron, exactly. I knew it started with a G. Couldn't remember there for a moment. So Geron is beginning the first uh, human stem cell trial in spinal cord injury patients. There will be 10 patients enrolled. That should be beginning very soon. It was delayed. And then the last thing I want to talk about is cooling because their cooling was a big hot topic when Kevin Everett was injured. And you all probably remember that. He played for the Buffalo Bills and he was injured on the field and they immediately treated him with cooled IV saline. And he went to TIER, the Texas Institute for Rehabilitation Research, Rehabilitation and Research, where he did his rehab. And um, he did very well. And the question was, did the cooling have something to do with it? We know that, in, and cooling comes from cardiac treatment. So people who have big MIs or cardiac issues, if they're cooled, you decrease inflammation and you preserve heart tissue. So everybody thought, well, if you cool somebody, could you preserve neural tissue? So it has never really been studied, but Dr. Barth Green at the Miami Project currently has a trial looking at cooling. And he, I guess the, the coach had heard about this and, had, and the, the athletic trainers and the physicians on the field had cooled saline and they were able to start saline immediately that was cooled on Kevin Everett. And then he had really great recovery. And so everybody said, was it because he was cooled or did he really have a minimal deficit injury? Was the injury not so severe. And that has been the big question. So I did a little research and went back to look at cooling and I found an article that had been published in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, and it looked at people who had been cooled who had traumatic brain injury. And it showed that those people who had been cooled with traumatic brain injury showed no statistically significant improvement in function versus those patients who are not cooled. And in fact, they actually had poorer outcomes. So will cooling actually help or will it not? So it'll be interesting to see because in brain injury, it didn't work. They actually did poorer than those who had been cooled. So cooling is an option, but we really don't know. It seemed miraculous when it happened with Kevin Everett. I actually gave a talk at TIER as well, and it was very funny because I just kidded them about their excellent rehab and wonderful care, and that he, he did so well that I was sure it was because he had gone to TIER. But I think he would have done well if he had come to BU as well. <laughs> I think he probably had a minimal deficit injury. So that's the first part of this talk. Really sciencey, very complex. And before we go any further into staying healthy, this might be an opportunity to take some questions, if anybody has any questions about this part of the talk. Are there any questions? OK. There's a microphone that's going to come to you. And if you will speak into the microphone, it'll be recorded. And then everyone will hear it that the webcast is going to, as well as it'll be preserved onto the, onto the DVD for the web. This one's working. Here. Okay. Here you go. Okay, doctor, I have a question. You mentioned these uh, Canadian studies, and I wonder if there's any difference in protocol between 
Canada and the United States, you know, considering the way the FDA goes about approving things, I'm wondering if anything happened more quickly in Canada and what were the results? So the Canadian studies, uh, uh, the protocols are virtually the same between Canada and for studies. You know, whether the Canadian uh, FDA, or I'm not sure what they call it in Canada, approves studies more rapidly, I also don't know. But I know from the North American Clinical Trials Network, which we're participating in, uh, which I'm the data safety monitor, two of the sites are in Canada. So they're following, we're all following the same protocol for this study that is across the border. So studies that are done in Canada, I think, follow scientific protocols. Um, I think that their results are not skewed by their protocols. I, whether drugs come to the market quicker in Canada, I'm not sure because I don't know what their FDA approval process is like. Are there any other questions? Let's get a microphone, okay? Somebody will run up here with a microphone for you. Actually, we'll get you next, okay? I think there's somebody um, back there. These medicines that you mentioned, mentioned can only be used if your injury is new? So these are all new injury medications. There's still research studies that are being done other than the steroid protocol. Uh, but the ones that I mentioned later are still being studied and they're mostly being studied in animals right now. But those studies will go on into humans. And if those studies are proven to be effective in humans and the side effects are not too severe, I suspect that the FDA will probably approve those and they will be used in acute injuries immediately after the injury, yeah, exactly. And I think there was a question up here. I've got, I've got a mic. Okay, great. My question is, um, all these drugs were so-called be right after the injury. Um, so if you're many years into your injury now, are these drugs going to help you in any way? So these drugs, this part of the talk was really a review to tell you what is happening with spinal cord injury. These drugs are not for use in, for people who are further out from their injury. But there are other trials, which I mentioned. There are stem cell trials which are going on, uh, which will, uh, Dr. Kirstead has a trial in acute injury and he's gonna have a trial in chronic injury as well. So there are also drug trials that are going on for chronic injuries and stem cell trials, but I thought that I would give an update about the acute treatment in this talk. Okay, was there another question over here? You spoke about um, cell, cells dying from pressure on the nerves. Yes. Okay, now if a person is dealing with like uh, arthritis, osteoarthritis, mm -hmm. um, if it's very difficult for the doctors to see how, where the pressure is coming from, you know, would an anti-inflammatory still be recommended? Because uh, I mean, if you can't f see the pressure area, but the points are being felt physically, in a certain section, how do you deal with that? So, you know, we do use steroids, epidural steroids, for people who have nerves that are pinched by arthritis. So arthritis is a little different because arthritis affects peripheral nerves and, and those nerves are not part of the central nervous system, so those nerves are not typically the spinal cord. The spinal cord can be compressed by something called spinal stenosis. Spinal stenosis is when there's a narrowing of the canal that the cord sits in. Spinal stenosis can either be congenital from birth or it can be caused by arthritis. Arthritis is a thickening of the bone and as bones thicken, they often decrease the size of the diameter of the hole, the foramen, and so you can have pressure on a cord. Typically, those patients do not receive steroids because it's over a long period of time and essentially what is happening is it's not an acute injury, but you see people gradually becoming weak over a period of time and there are many patients, you know, I've even said the treatment is surgical and you go in and you cut the canal 
and you open up the cord, and that's called a lamin the canal, and that's called a laminectomy. So there's more space for the cord to be in. So those patients do not receive steroid. But patients who have peripheral nerve injuries, so people who may have a nerve root entrapment or a herniated disc, can receive steroids that are injected under a radiological guidance to the peripheral nerve to decrease inflammation of a peripheral nerve. So we do use steroids for peripheral nerve in injuries. So if you had arthritis in your back, so here's the canal, the cord is coming down, the nerves are coming off of it. As the nerve comes out and exit, it goes through another little hole called a foramen, and this is a peripheral nerve. It's coming off the cord. So peripheral nerves are very different from nerves in the central nervous system, but they can become entrapped, and if there were arthritis in this foramen pinching that nerve, you might have numbness and tingling, muscle spasm, weakness in your leg or your arm, or in one specific muscle group, and essentially you could have a needle placed and steroid injected into that under radiological guidance, but you usually see that on MRI, so that's different, okay? Okay. Anything else? Okay, so we'll go on to the second part of the talk, which is staying healthy with spinal cord injury. So many of you know this, there are significant challenges to people with spinal cord injury in staying healthy. These include finding a primary care physician. It's just sometimes impossible to find a primary care physician. There's a shortage of primary care physicians in Massachusetts, but we're going to go on and talk about the challenges even within, if you can find someone, what the challenges are. We also, there are challenges to people in ensuring that patients with spinal cord injury are receiving the appropriate recommended routine health screenings. And then we have people with spinal cord injury who are aging with spinal cord injury. And how does aging affect them? And then we have the health challenges of preventing the secondary effects of paralysis. And those of you who participated in our care call study know that that was one of the goals of that educational process in those phone calls was to educate people about how to prevent the secondary effects of paralysis. So in terms of primary care for people with spinal cord injury, people with severe mobility impairments such as spinal cord injury have great difficulty locating primary care physicians who are knowledgeable in caring for their special needs, whose office is handicapped accessible, and physicians who are often just confident in their ability to provide care for people with spinal cord injury. One of the things that always struck me, about eight years ago I had a patient who was acutely injured. Her primary care physician was here at Boston Medical Center and she's a very well respected and very smart woman. And when the patient was being discharged from rehab, I called her and I said, you know, she's being discharged and I will continue to follow her for her needs associated with her spinal cord injury and I've made an appointment for her to see you in four weeks as her primary care physician. And she said, don't send her to me, I don't know what to do. And I thought, you're a primary care physician. You do the things that primary care physicians do. You treat colds, you treat bronchitis, you give vaccinations, you recommend preventive health care screenings. And I said, you do know what to do. And I said, if you come across something that's related to the spinal cord injury, remember I'm right here. All you have to do is call me and I'll see the patient. But many people are very intimidated with people who have severe neurological injuries. They're just afraid of not doing the right thing. So that is also a barrier. And therefore, many people with SCI never get the recommended preventive health maintenance screenings. So there was an interesting study that was done by Dr. Donnelly and Susie Charlefew at the Craig uh, Hospital. And it looked at utilization, access, and satisfaction with primary care among people with spinal cord injuries. And it was a comparison of three countries. So they did a cross-sectional study. It was a survey. And they looked at utilization, accessibility, and satisfaction in the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom. And essentially, they surveyed 373 individuals with spinal cord injury. And it was a male survey and they had 93% of individuals reported having a family doctor. So most of those people, I suspect, were in Canada and the UK. Uh, when we looked at it, 63% had a spinal cord injury specialist and 56% had both. 
so only half of people had both. So when you think about that, when we went back and looked, Canadians were most likely to receive primary health care from their family physicians and Americans were most likely to receive it from their physiatrist. So I uh, would say that Canadian citizens are probably getting pretty good primary care, but are their primary care physicians treating their spinal cord injury problems and preventing their secondary effects of paralysis? And in the United States, being a physiatrist, I think that I'm pretty well aware of how to treat spinal cord injury, but do I remember that at 40, a woman should have a mammogram, and do I remember to send her? I might not, because I wasn't trained as a primary care physician. So the ideal is to have both, but it's hard to find both. And we see from this study that 50% of people can't find both in those three countries. Two of those countries have socialized medical systems, and one does not. So there's a challenge across all uh, ways of delivering medicine for people to receive the two types of care that they need. So what I keep talking about preventative health maintenance screenings. What do I mean? These are the national recommendations from the Center for Disease Control. And they are mammogram at age 40 for women, routine pap smears yearly, prostate cancer screening for men beginning at age 50, most men, colorectal cancer screening beginning at age 50, and coronary artery disease risk factor screening, which means looking at your cholesterol levels, looking at your lipids, looking at your triglycerides, et cetera. So we're going to talk about that as we go through. Interestingly, there was a study that was done by Sherry Lavella at the VA hospital in Ohio. And actually, I emailed back and forth with her about this study. It was really shocking to me, because when you think about, we're going to talk about the study, and then I'm going to give you my spin on it. So it was a cross-sectional survey among female veterans, and there were 478 uh, female veterans uh, who were able-bodied, and there were 115 with spinal cord injury. And essentially, she did the study by looking at a survey system called the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System that is actually administered by the government routinely. And what she found, uh, this was done in 2003, is she found that women who had spinal cord injury in the VA system, that fewer female veterans with SCI received dental care, received, fewer women with SCI received colorectal cancer screening, fewer women with SCI received mammograms, fewer women with SCI received pap smears than their able-bodied counterparts at the VA. And when you really think about it, I think this study is really important because the VA is a socialized system of medicine where medicine is available to everyone. And it's supposed to be comprehensive. And if there's such disparity at the VA system, what is happening in the non-VA system? So we can extrapolate that and assume that many women with spinal cord injury are receiving virtually none of their care, probably their preventive maintenance screening, and probably the same thing's happening for men. And I'm going to tell you a really sad story about one of my patients, actually a woman that I really loved. About 14 months ago, she decided that she was going to have an ileal loop diversion. She was going to uh, get a new a neobladder, a new bladder, so that she could catheterize herself. She was 47 years old. She was worked up by a urologist at an outside hospital. She had started coming to me. She had been injured for about six years. She had been coming to me for about two years. We sent her uh, for her uh, ileal loop diversion, and when they did it, they opened her up, and she had stage four cervical cancer with mets everywhere. They closed her up. And instead of going home with a new bladder, she went home on hospice, and she died six months later. Purely preventable with pap, sc pap smear screening. Very sad. So, you know, at BMC, there's a fully accessible GYN clinic, and there is an OBGYN who specifically is interested in GYN and OB care for women with disabilities. And it's a fully accessible clinic, and I have toured it. And so if you're not receiving your pap smear and you're my patient, let me know, because we're going to get you there. Um, so 
there are other instances, and we're going to talk about them. So prostate cancer screening in men with spinal cord injury. When I looked at prostate screening and I put in keywords into PubMed, prostate screening and spinal cord injury, all that came up were two articles. Two articles. So one of these was a, a study that had been done at the University of Georgia and the Palo Alto VA by Dr. Scott and Perkash, Inder Perkash, who I know very well at the Palo Alto VA. And it was published in the Journal of Urology in March of 2004. And essentially, this study showed that men with spinal cord injury were diagnosed with prostate cancer at more advanced stages than their able-bodied, uh, than able-bodied men. Now this is most likely due to the fact that men with spinal cord injury and prostate cancer are diagnosed when they present with the medical complications associated with later stage prostate cancer versus able-bodied men who are routinely screened with digital prostate exams and PSA levels. And now I understand that there's a lot of controversy around uh, PSA level screening, but I think it's that this was a really interesting study again because almost all of our spinal cord patients are routinely seen by urologists. And are the urologists simply not doing a digital exam when the patient's on the table? So if you're a man and you're over 50, the next time you see the urologist, ask him to check your PSA and to do a digital prostate exam. I think they just don't think about it. Um, very important. Colonoscopy. I looked at colonoscopy and there was one article in PubMed. And it was done by Johnson and Steve Kirschbloom at the Kessler Institute. And it was done in New Jersey and it was published in uh, Spinal Cord in 2005. And it was 199 community living adults with spinal cord injury who were surveyed, once again using this behavioral uh, uh, survey, BRFAS, to determine if they had received their routine health screenings, including colorectal cancer. And it found that among participants 58 years of age or older, 47% had neither had a stool test for occult blood, which is very easy. Every time somebody does a rectal exam, they can pull it out, take a little stool, put it on a little card, squirt some fluid on it, this agent, and if there's blood in your stool, it shows up. So 47% hadn't even had that simple test. Uh, and an even greater percentage had not had colonoscopy. So colonoscopy is recommended at age 50. Now colonoscopy with spinal cord injury, we all think not so easy to do. But those of you who are my patients and I've recommended it, you know that you can be admitted the night before. Your insurance company will pay for the bowel prep in the hospital the night before. You can have the colonoscopy the next morning and be discharged. So you don't have to worry about having large volumes of stool everywhere and not being able to protect your skin and to stay clean, it can be done and it can be done easily. And it's really important to do. If you have uh, a clean colonoscopy at 50, you don't need one for 10 years. If there's something that's found, you may need one sooner. But everybody should have one at age 50. And now we're going to talk about cardiovascular disease. And these were some of the most shocking aspects of my research that I did. So as we know, cardiovascular disease is a growing concern for the spinal cord injury population. In years past, people with spinal cord injury died of pneumonia and urosepsis. So they got urinary tract infections and pneumonia and they died. Uh, with better uh, education of patients and the development of the model systems of care, patients no longer die of urinary tract infections and pneumonia, but they die of the same thing that everybody else does, which is coronary artery disease. And so um, I wanted to find out what is the incidence of coronary artery disease? Does it occur more rapidly in patients with spinal cord injury? Um, so for long-term SCI patients, is the morbidity and mortality of cardiovascular disease uh, greater? So this was an interesting article that was published in the American Journal of PMNR, Physical Medicine Rehabilitation in February of 2007. And it looked at people uh, with spinal cord injury and cardiovascular disease. And essentially, what they found was that SCI subjects, when compared to able-bodied patients, 
uh, had a greater prevalence of obesity, a greater prevalence of lipid disorders, and a greater prevalence of metabolic syndrome. Now metabolic syndrome is a setup for coronary artery disease and heart attack MI. And the metabolic syndrome includes obesity, high cholesterol, and hypertension. And we're going to talk in a few minutes about the incidence of metabolic syndrome in people who have spinal cord injury. But we know that it's hard to get exercise. So many people with spinal cord injury do have problems with obesity. With obesity comes problems with high cholesterol and typically high LDL cholesterol, which is not the good cholesterol, and low HDL cholesterol, which is the good cholesterol. And we also know that as patients, who have spinal cord injury, as there's muscle atrophy, that muscle is replaced by fat. And fat does not metabolize glucose at the same rate as muscle tissue. And so spinal cord injury patients often have greater incidences of diabetes. So there's a setup for coronary artery disease. As well, people who have autonomic dysreflexia and have abnormal blood pressure and abnormal heart rates and arrhythmias associated with autonomic dysreflexia seem to also have an increased risk for coronary artery disease. So when we looked at lipid screening, there was a study that was uh, done in Turkey, actually. It was uh, published in the Journal of Military Medicine in 2003, and they looked at 28 healthy control subjects who were matched for age and sex with 60 people who had spinal cord injury with a mean duration of three and a half years. So people who were three and a half years out of their spinal cord injury. And when compared with the healthy subjects, the people with spinal cord injury had lower L, uh, had higher LDL levels, the bad cholesterol, and lower HDL levels, the good cholesterol. So we already know that that is occurring and it's been shown in a study and something that we would have anticipated. Dr. Nash, Mark Nash from uh, the Miami Project who has been here and talked before and has a big strong interest in cardiac disease and people with spinal cord injury also did a study and he looked at um, the guidelines for a guideline needed a guideline driven assessment of need for cardiovascular disease risk intervention. So it was looking at the guidelines for coronary artery disease intervention in able bodied people, and he compared that to people who had chronic paraplegia. And so he took, this was published in the Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehab in June of 2007. He took 41 subjects who had motor complete paraplegia at the T6 through 11 levels, and he followed them for two years to determine who qualified for lipid-lowering interventions, such as statins. And he looked at those, uh, he also looked at the National Cholesterol Education Project and adult treatment panels. So he looked at um, lipid-lowering agents, uh, cholesterol levels, and the adult treatment panel is for, uh, about the treatment of uh, hypertension. And essentially what he found was that 34% of subjects qualified for hypertension intervention guidelines. So 34% of these patients who had paraplegia greater than two years had high blood pressure. 76% had HDL cholesterol levels below the criterion for for treatment in able-bodied people, which was 40 milligrams per deciliter, so they had very low HDL levels. And 34% of them had metabolic syndrome. So 34% of them were at a significant risk for cardiac, uh, for cardiac uh, uh, effect. So silent coronary artery disease in people with spinal cord injury. Bauman published an article in the archives in 1994. And what he did was he looked at 20 patients who had no symptoms of coronary artery disease. So they didn't have any chest pain. They hadn't had shortness of breath. 
And these were all paraplegic patients who were able to perform upper arm or ergometry or cycling. And he uh, did a test with thallium, which is a chemical test. It's a chemical stress test. And all of these patients had normal EKGs prior to uh, having the chemical stress test. And once they had the chemical stress test, 65% had evidence of ischemic heart disease. So that was pretty shocking to me. The next study, which was published by Lee, and he's from Japan, and it was in the International Heart Journal in May of 2006, once again looked at 47 asymptomatic spinal cord patients who received a chemical stress test. And these subjects were stratified into four groups. Complete quadriplegia, incomplete quadriplegia, complete paraplegia, incomplete paraplegia. And there, was no, there were no significant differences in sex distribution, ages, or spinal cord injury duration, or cardiac disease risk factors among the spinal cord patients in the four groups. And he found that 30 out of 47, or virtually 64% of these patients, also had ischemic findings. So we know that people have probably development of coronary artery disease faster, and that it can be silent and not evident, so they may have heart attacks earlier. So it's something to think about. So then I pose the question, should spinal cord injury be considered a coronary artery disease equivalent? What do I mean by coronary artery disease equivalent? So um, coronary artery disease equivalent is a way of, uh, let me explain it as diabetics. For instance, a patient who's able-bodied who has diabetics, diabetes, we know that they have terrible vascular disease usually. So their primary care physicians treat them with lipid lowering agents aggressively um, early. So people with diabetics who are able-bodied get lipid lowering agents very early. And my question is, we know that spinal cord injury patients have very poor lipid profiles, that they have high cholesterol, that a third of them have metabolic syndrome, and that 65% of them have ischemic evidence of uh, heart disease on chemical study. So should we also be treating them very early with statins? And we know from um, the Texas Air Force base study, which was a study looking at healthy men, that when you put healthy men at this, uh, in this study at, the, at, the, at a Texas Air Force base, when they were placed on statins, that 33% of them had a reduced incidence of vascular events. So statins have been shown to be excellent primary prevention uh, drugs, and I personally think that we might get a greater bang for our buck by treating our spinal cord injury uh, patients with statins earlier. And the last thing I want to talk about is this slide, and it is, is spinal cord injury a risk factor for immunosuppression? Denise Campagnolo at the Barrows Institute for uh, Neurological Surgery in Phoenix, who was previously at the Kessler Institute, has studied a lot of MS patients, but she also has interest in spinal cord injury. And essentially, she started this work in 1994 and has published several articles over the years, including an article in 2000 and her most recent article, which was published in July of 2008 showing that there's actually altered immunity following spinal cord injury. And she wanted to know whether the autonomic dysregulation of the sympathetic nervous system had something to do with this immune suppression. So the study that she did here was 36 spinal cord age, the injured patients were age and sex matched with 36 healthy adults. And they were stratified into two groups, those with injuries below T6 and those with injuries above T6, because T6 is the cutoff point for autonomic dysreflexia. People who have injuries above T6 are at risk for autonomic dysreflexia. And she was wondering if autonomic dysref dysreflexia, which affects the sympathetic nervous system, in some ways may also affect the immune system. And what she found was that in the patients who had spinal cord injury, there were fewer natural killer uh, cells. So these are cells that are uh, part of the immune system that go out and attack 
uh, disease. And so she suspected that there's immune suppression in patients. And she did not see a difference between people with injuries above or below T6, but she just found that all patients who had spinal cord injury had fewer of these cells. So we assume that there is probably some immune suppression going on over a long period of time. And this may be why people with spinal cord injury have more urinary tract infections, although we also suspect it's related to indwelling catheters and intermittent catheterization. Why patients with spinal cord injury have more pneumonia, it may be related to muscle paralysis, re respiratory muscle paralysis, and not able to clear secretions, but it may also be related to immune suppression. Why people with spinal cord injury who get skin breakdown have osteomyelitis or bone infections more commonly. Maybe it's because their pressure ulcers go to the bone more rapidly, but maybe it's attributable also to immune suppression. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done looking at immune suppression in spinal cord injury, but it appears that people from her work who have spinal cord injury may have immune suppression in and of itself. So my final thoughts are that we can obviously need, we could use greater research into the therapeutics to prevent the inflammatory response. We could obviously use greater research into stem cells. We could use greater research into surgical interventions earlier. We need to educate primary care physicians in the care of people with spinal cord injury to enable our patients to receive the best evidence-based treatment for prevention of common medical problems like colon cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, um, and that we also need further research into immune suppression and spinal cord injury. So I guess what I want you to do is advocate for yourself. I want you to go back when this is posted on the website and just look at that routine screening that is recommended from the CDC and I want you to talk to your primary care physician when you see them. So if you're a woman and you're over age 40, I want you to think about have you had a mammogram. And I want you to ask your primary care physician to get it for you. And if you don't have a primary care physician, ask your physiatrist to get it for you. If you're a man over age 50, you need to have a prostate uh, screening. When you go to your urologist next time and you're there for your urodynamic study, ask him if you'll do a digital prostate exam that you want to know and you want to have your PSA drawn. You know, advocate for colonoscopy. If you're a woman, have your annual pap smear. If you're having difficulty, let someone know. If your physician doesn't know where to go, remember that there's an accessible clinic here at BMC, a GYN clinic. Advocate for yourself, stay healthy, and the gist of this talk is uh, to remember that you need these preventive screens just like everyone else. So are there questions about this section of the talk? Do you want to go first? She's going to do it first. Doctor, I have a question. Sure. I'm very happy that I've had two of the prophylactic uh, uh, <coughs> procedures that you discussed. I've had a colonoscopy, and I, I, I don't know if I said that right. I've had a, what, what was it, a, not a colonoscopy. Colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. Colonoscopy, and I've also, I'm on Lipitor, which is a statin, I assume. Exactly. Now, my HDL, or the, the good one, is still a little low, and my bad one is still a little high. Uh, but I think that's all under my control with diet. Uh, the question I have is that you said that the colonoscopy uh, uh, is only good for about 10 years, or that's what you implied. So should I be looking to have some other surgery or some evaluation? Uh, I had my colonoscopy in, two, colonoscopy in 2005. It's worked magnificently. I, I don't know how I would have existed without it. Um, so. Um, should I be looking in the next five years to do something different um, as a prophylactic procedure? 
No, if you had a normal colonoscopy in 2005, you do not need another uh, colonoscopy in 2015. That's the standard recommendation. So if you had a good, clean colonoscopy with no findings at age 50, you don't need another one for 10 years. If there were any findings that were abnormal, if you had had polyps or anything strange, your primary care physician would have recommended that you have follow-up colonoscopy sooner. Doctor, I said the wrong thing. I knew it wasn't a colonoscopy. <laughs> it was the other thing. Was it they? a colostomy? A colostomy, that's yes. right. Okay, yes. I'm an old man. So <laughs> no, no, no. No, I had so that. So did colostomy you? is different. So mm -hmm. colostomy is a surgical procedure where right. you have a your colon attached to uh, your abdominal wall and many people with spinal cord injury have found colostomy a wonderful way to manage their bowels. You still need a colonoscopy and they can do a colonoscopy through the colostomy site. They can take the tube and go right up and look at your colon from there as well. Okay. So you do need that test. Thank you, Doctor. Sure. <coughs> Dr. Williams, uh, regarding the, uh, your primary care physician, is there something in the medical school system that can be done to, I know there's a myriad of diseases and you can't, you know, that's why you have the rotations and stuff like that, but I've had neurologists, re resident neurologists here not know what to do with a spinal cord injury patient. And I'm just wondering if there is a way... To disseminate information? Yeah, I mean, again, we, we see different residents and interns rotate through the system. Right. And I'm just wondering, I had to teach my primary care doctor about autonomic dysreflexia. Right. Uh, because they don't. One of, one of the things you know that is difficult for people with spinal cord injury is that you often have to teach your own health care providers about your injury and about the risk factors that you have as a result of it. You know, spinal cord injury, um, as you know from the study that was done by the National Paralysis Task Force from the Reeve Foundation, there are about one. 0.375 million people living with paralysis, uh, spinal cord injury paralysis in the U.S. About 5,600,000 5, people living with paralysis from various sources, the major one being stroke. But so, you know, almost one and a half million people in the U.S. are living with spinal cord injury. And unfortunately, the way the medical education system is set up right now, uh, there isn't a required rehabilitation rotation even at this medical school. But one of the things that we do try is to, um, there are students who are always, I mean, you've seen students when you've seen me in clinic. So there are students who have interest who are rotating through. We try to promote that through brown bag lunch seminars for students. Uh, I'm doing a Grand Rounds talk for the primary care internal medicine residents on June 3rd. And you know, you try to get out there and teach people about it. They are curious. Uh, one of the wonderful things was when I, I received the email from the chief resident in internal medicine recently saying, we would love for you to come and talk about primary care and people with spinal cord injury because we know it's a gap in our education. But uh, it, will, it is a struggle. It is a struggle because there are one and a half million people, which to me seems like a huge number, but is really not a huge number when there are 350 million people living in this country. So in many ways, we as physicians and our patients are going to have to educate people and that's why we try to educate you. You know, when, when you come to the office visit, I always say, this is what this is, this is why, this is the good side of this, this is the bad side of it. You have to make your choice about what you want to do and then you're, you're going to have to do that all along. You're all going to have to educate people and we're all going to have to continue doing that. It's sad, but it's true. I think there was another question. Hi, my name's Denise. I have been in the chair for 35 years, and you, I'm talking about cardiac care. 
Um, my blood pressure has always been like 90 over 60. Mm -hmm. Should I, I be concerned about it being so low? No, typically after spinal cord injury, people do have low blood pressures, and that's because the sympathetic nervous system is affected. The sympathetic nervous system affects the vessels below the level of the lesion, and the sympathetic nervous system is what typically causes our veins to contract and push blood back up. After a spinal cord injury, our veins are not uh, very uh, efficient at pumping blood back up, and that might be why you have some swelling in your feet at the end of the day. If you have spasticity, that can help pump blood up. Um, and, you know, uh, but because of that uh, uh, interruption in the sympathetic nervous system, almost all spinal cord patients have blood pressures where the top number is somewhere between 80 and 100 and the bottom number is somewhere between 50 and 80. And so one of the things though that you should think about is if your blood pressure were even 120 over 80, that would be high for you because your normal blood pressure is 90 over 60. Right. But your primary care physician may see that as a normal blood pressure because we anticipate that able-bodied people have blood pressures of 120 over 80, but that may actually be hypertension for you. So it's something also to be aware of. You know, it's like when we do a metabolic panel, and I always tell my medical students, people who have spinal cord injury, when we check their creatinine, your BUN and creatinine, which checks your kidney function. Normal creatinine is one, but normal creatinine in an able-bodied person is one. That's because we're walking around all day and we're having muscle breakdown from the tissues in our legs. When your spinal cord injured, you're not gonna have that muscle breakdown, so your creatinine is gonna be low. So your creatinine is gonna be 0.3 to 0.5, and when your creatinine goes to one, it means you're having kidney failure. But in an able-bodied person, that's normal. So there's a lot of education to do even with primary care physicians and to make them think this way. But with the blood pressure being so low, would that It be wouldn't be treated at 120 over 80 No, still. that's not my question, oh. sir. If, if it's lower, would your, because your heart's not pumping as hard as a walking person, would you be more capable, more? At risk? Yes. No. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? We have some live stream questions. Sure. And the first one is, um, are there any support systems or resources where people can share information on primary care doctors that have knowledge and comfort with spinal cord injury patients? I am not aware of uh, a support system. And it's a wonderful idea of something to start. Um, you know, it would be wonderful if Maybe we started a blog here at BMC about primary care and made it available to primary care physicians. That's something that we should think about in our own little research group. But uh, I am not currently aware of one, but I think that it could easily be done in a blog system, et cetera, or Twitter, tweeting about primary care. <laughs> Multimedia. Are there others? There are more questions. Um, uh, the next one is, um, please ask Dr. Williams. I'm a C7 quadriplegic as a result of a gunshot wound. I recently suffered a herniated disc at the C3 level. They gave me a Medrol pack. What effect would that have on my injury? So the Medrol pack wouldn't have any effect. It's a short burst of steroid that is for six days. And its goal is to decrease the inflammation around the peripheral nerve at C3 that is uh, entrapped. Um, and it doesn't cross something called the blood-brain barrier. The body is very uh, protective of the brain and the spinal cord and there's something called the blood-brain barrier and many medications do not cross the blood-brain barrier. That's why when people are acutely injured they get these enormous doses of the methylprednisolone protocol. We're just pounding them with it hoping that we can get some of it into their uh, CSF fluid. So a Medrol dose pack shouldn't have any effect on a spinal cord injury but will hopefully help decrease pain from the peripheral nerve injury. And he adds that he had a bad case of autonomic dysreflexia along with the her herniated disc. Yes, I, 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 anything that is painful could cause autonomic dysreflexia. So the herniated disc probably entrapped the nerve, caused pain, and resulted in autonomic dysreflexia.
Somebody's going to come with a microphone, I think. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Doctor, I, uh, when I'm um, C5, 6, 7 was infused, and just yesterday I was talking to someone about a patch, putting a patch on for pain. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about a patch. Mm -hmm. I take Xanaflex, Tizanidine, Tramadol. But can you tell me about a patch? So there are various patches. So it's hard to know what kind of patch they were talking about. But there are narcotic patches, uh, like Dorgesic or Fentanyl, that can be used to treat pain. And then there's something called a lidoderm patch. And lidoderm is lidocaine. And it's a patch that can also be placed. Many people, is your pain mostly in your neck and shoulders? Yeah. From That's the most. Transferring. Uh, from transferring, meaning a lot of shoulder pain. Yeah. So that's a very typical place for people after spinal cord injury, uh, quadriplegia in particular, to have pain is in their neck and their upper back and their shoulders because this is one of the places where you have a lot of sensation. You have normal sensation left. And it's also a place that takes a lot of the stress because your arms aren't as, aren't as strong as they used to be. So they pull down and they pull on those muscles. You also had surgery probably at some time and those muscles were cut in your neck and so there's some inflammation probably there that can last a very long period of time. People can have pain in their neck after surgery. And I find that you know if pain lasts more than six months, it becomes chronic pain and it's much more difficult to get rid of chronic pain. And so oftentimes our goal is to treat pain that's chronic to the point that we know we're not going to get rid of it, but to make it bearable. So not knowing which type of patch they're talking about, I suspect it's either a narcotic patch or a lidoderm patch. And lidoderm is lidocaine, which is the same thing that the dentist injects into your tooth when you're having a filling or some type of dental procedure. And lidocaine has been shown, it can be absorbed through the skin and has been shown to uh, help with some, in particular, burning pain, neuropathic pain. Great. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Since people with SCI, the blood circulation is weaker, is there, is there any medication or treatment to make it move faster or no, there isn't. You know, typically below the level of injury, the blood, as you said, the circulation is poorer. And that's why there's risk of uh, blood clot, et cetera. But there aren't any medications that actually help your blood move faster. If you've had a blood clot, patients sometimes have, are placed on blood thinners. They do not make your blood actually move faster, but just help prevent further clot. Um, so, unfortunately, no, there isn't. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Hi, we have another live stream question. And uh, it is, with spring and summer coming, what's the best ways to regulate and be aware of body temperature and changes? So obviously, people who have spinal cord injury have difficulty controlling their uh, body temperature. The body, the, the hypothalamus in the brain is what helps us control body temperature. And in all people, as blood passes over the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus is able to detect even minute changes in the blood temperature, either down or below. If it senses that you're cold and you're able-bodied, you shiver. If it senses that you're hot and you're able-bodied, you sweat. In people who have complete spinal cord injury, they're not able to shiver below their level of injury. So they can't increase their body temperature. So when it's cold, people who have spinal cord injury need to be appropriately dressed to stay warm. It's the same thing when it's hot. Your people who have spinal cord injury can't sweat below the level of injury, usually. So you have a hard time disseminating heat. 
So you need to be very cognizant when it's warm outside that uh, you're not out too long in direct sunlight, that uh, if it's a very hot day that you're drinking cool fluids, and also I would try not to be out for significant periods of time. Everybody should go outside and enjoy the beautiful sunshine, but just don't go out to the beach when it's 100 degrees and sit there all day. Not only will you get potential heat stroke, but you'll probably get melanoma too. So, you know, another thing to be, <laughs> for us all to think about. But, um, so it's being cognizant of your environment. And if you're out and it's very hot, go in for a little bit. You can always go back out, but go into an air conditioned space. Very good question. Another question is, uh, if people are on vents and the medications that were mentioned earlier, are they still at long-term risk for worse health problems? So that question is a little bit vague because we're not sure of um, the medications they're on, et cetera. But the higher the level of injury, the more difficult it is to get an aerobic workout. And an aerobic workout is what helps prevent coronary artery disease. So if you can upper arm cycle, it's good for upper arm cycle because actually cycling with your arms gives you a greater uh, aerobic workout than not. So many patients who are on ventilators, patients who have injuries above C5, often don't have any uh, arm movement that allows them to have independent arm cycling, but they could use functional electrical stimulation arm cycling. And uh, that can be done in physical therapy, and RTI actually has, uh, which is Restorative Therapies International, actually has an FES uh, upper arm ergometry cycle that can be used in all patients. That's a little bit difficult to, to ask, but I mean, to answer, but um, people who are on ventilators, I think, have, are a little bit more at risk for coronary artery disease, are a little bit more at risk for diabetes because they probably have greater muscular atrophy even in their arms where the muscles atrophy and the uh, tissue becomes more fatty and they have greater risk for diabetes. I think we're going to take just one more question, okay. and then we'll wrap up. All right. Um, another, the last question then is: seating and positioning is a big issue for people with spinal cord injuries. I saw there was a meeting in Vancouver. How can we be kept current on the significant development that, from the, that come from these meetings? And does Dr. Williams have a website or an email address? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, um, so I do have uh, a website. You could probably email, I uh, can't remember the, what's the? The website's uh, www.bmc.org slash rehab. And is there a way to email the site? I believe there is a, con there's our email address um, is on there. If you email rehab at bmc.org, that will come to us as well. And I, and I can get the email that will be forwarded to me through that website. And um, so a lot of these meetings obviously are places where people are presenting early findings. Some of them are from animal studies, some of them are from people studies, and, and many of the presentations may not be FDA approved devices, but they're just letting scientists be aware of them. So one of the things I would suggest is that, you know, uh, if there are topics that you're interested in, in particular, is filling out your survey because this is the whole purpose of this lecture series, is to bring you the information you want. And so if you want to know about seating and, and different seating capabilities, I think that's a wonderful topic and I'm sure that we can find an expert who could come here and talk about that. And that's why these surveys are so important. There isn't one place where you can get all this information, but you know that this bi-monthly lecture series is a place where you can ask for the information you want and we will do our best to provide an expert to answer that question and to give you that information. I think there might be one more question. And this will be the How are you doing? My name is Phil. And I'm a, um, my name is Phil and I'm, I'm a T10 from a gunshot wound about like 11, 12 years ago. 
you know, and I'm, I mean, I'm a little bit over 30, but you know what I mean? But I'm still, I, I move like I'm 20, but any, you know, is there any, um, any researchers for, you know what I mean, people like, like, like take, I mean, that wants to like, give you, give a line, give a doctor like a permission to work on them or do a study of research that can um, stop building them. To take, I mean, like basically like a risk, but you know what I mean, but a chance. Anything going on? So there are there are various studies. You know, you can find probably some information on. Uh, you could find information on various uh, websites for the model systems. In particular, there's a lot of information about research projects going on. Uh, at the Miami Project website. Uh, you can also probably look at Care Cure, where you might get some information. It's a blog where people talk back and forth with spinal cord injury about different studies that are available that people are participating in. There are studies here. Uh, none of them are particularly invasive in terms of stem cells or things like that. But there are uh, studies going on. I would look at universities, and I would look at uh, the websites for universities in particular and hospitals that have spinal cord injury programs. And I would start with NIDR, the NIDR website, which is the National Institute on Disability Rehabilitation Research. And it's a great place to direct you. The Christopher Reeve Foundation may also be a wonderful place to direct you. OK? I just want to say thank you and big up. Much love to everybody going through the going, going through the struggle. You know, we all soldiers. We never give up. We all fighters. Hey, Ma. Hey, Miss Niles. <laughs> so thank you all very much for coming. I hope that you gained some good information. Remember, this will be up in about six weeks on the website. And I would encourage you to check back in particular for that one simple slide that tells you the preventative health maintenance screenings and to talk to your primary care physicians about it. So thank you very much. Travel safely home. And we'll see you again in two months. Take care. Good night. Thanks, Steve.